Capitalist Unconscious, Marx and Lacan by Tim Osomsek. And this is chapter three, part three of The Organ and the Animal. The notion of the fetish wraps up Marx's correction of the political economic misperception of the autonomy of value. Rather than conceiving this autonomy in a substantialist sense, which makes the value a positive quality of commodities and eventually a vital force of capitalist abstractions, the critical turn departs from the autonomy of logical relations. Every act of exchange contains an abstraction, which always already articulates a system of differences. Exchange value follows the same laws as the signifier, Yet the critical analysis of the fetish exposes other complications that follow from the double character of commodity. It is necessary to differentiate two objects, the object of need endowed with positive qualities and corresponding to empirical materiality, and the object that is produced within the autonomy of exchange value, whose materiality is of entirely different order. At this point, the fetish points towards the Lacanian object A. It is only when the status of that object that I call the object small a has been acknowledged that we will be able to give a meaning to the alleged impetus you attribute to the subject's revolutionary praxis of going beyond his alienated labor. In what way can one go beyond the alienation of his labor? It is as though you wanted to go beyond the alienation of discourse. All I can see is transcending that alienation is the object sustaining its value, but Marx, in a homonym singularly anticipatory of psychoanalysis, called the fetish, it being understood that psychoanalysis reveals its biological signification. This does not mean that the fetish is identical with the object A. The fetish is rather an attempt to fixate the logical object in an empirical object, and to conceal the gap that separates the two orders of reality. The problematic of castration, but also of alienation, which the fetish is supposed to foreclose from the symbolic, gravitates around this gap. In the critical context, the fetish becomes a hieroglyph of alienation, which conceals the link between alienation, production of surplus object, and production of subjectivity. Labor and speech are two processes from which alienation cannot be eliminated, for the simple reason that these are the actions of constitutive alienation, as Hegel has already noticed. Yet how does Marx's critical use of the fetish go together with the biological signification that Freud ended up privileging? If Marx's critique anticipates psychoanalysis, then Freud's idea of biology is more extravagant than it seems. Through the notion of the fetish, Freud explores the colonization of the anatomical and biological body by discursive abstraction. A return to the famous metapsychological writing on fetishism is called for at this point. It was there that Freud defined fetishism through a specific symbolic operation, which he called Verlugnung. The word means disavowal and represents a modality of negation. In Ver Verlugnung, we find the reference to luge, lie, which makes of the fetishist disavowal a procedure that presents castration as something untrue. The literal meaning of Verlugnung would be falsification, but a falsification that does not demonstrate anything. Instead, the fetishist tendency strives to replace the association of subjectivity and negativity with the fantasy of an uncastrated subject, jouissance without lack, and so on. This defense mechanism, characteristic for perversion, stands in between neurotic repression and psychotic, psychotic foreclosure. Negation places the conflict in the mental apparatus, preserving the border between external reality and psychic reality, while foreclosure situates the same conflict outside and thus abolishes the border between both orders of reality. In comparison to both procedures, disavowal operates at the very limit between the inside and the outside. Freud provides two definitions of Verlangnung. 
According to the first, disavowal concerns a representation, unlike repression, which targets the effect that the representation causes in the subject. This feature makes of repression a defense from internal impulses, while disavowal is directed against the demands of reality, striving for their neutralization. Yet the withdrawal it accomplishes does not have the radical character of foreclosure, in which the exterior is modified according to psychic reality, making the subject appear delirious. According to Freud's second definition, disavowal aims at perception, which again contains the reference to truth, and whose literal meaning is taking for true, recognition of truth. Fetishism is resistance against an already manifest verification. Worn among the persistence of truth in experience awakens a counter tendency, which demands a very energetic action in order to maintain the disavowal. Again, we come across the demand for labor, which is supposed to construct a non-conflictual reality, as in dreams and worldviews. How then does biological signification enter the picture? In the case of fetishism, that caught Freud's attention. The perception concerns the absence of penis on the female body, and more generally, the reduction of sexual difference to the binary opposition of presence and absence. Completeness and incompleteness. The fetishized object, a part of the body or any material object that can prolong human anatomy, becomes a substitute penis, a prosthetic organ of jouissance, whereby Freud remarks the following. When now I announce the fetish is a substitute for the penis, I shall certainly create a disappointment. So I hasten to add that it is not a substitute for any chance penis, but for a particular and quite special penis that had been extremely important in early childhood but had later been lost. That is to say, it should normally have been given up, but the fetish is precisely designed to preserve it from extinction. To put it more plainly, the fetish is a substitute for the woman's, the mother's, penis that the little boy once believed in, and for reasons familiar to us, does not want to give up. Sexual fetishism is restricted to the male subject. Without, pres without preserving the hypothesis of the woman's penis, the subject would have to confront his own castration, the possibility of losing what he understands as the privileged organ of jouissance. In its biological signification, fetishism thus stands for the unconscious belief in the non-castration of the woman, or more generally, a belief in some sort of sexual monism, according to which there is only one organ of jouissance, the penis, and consequently only one signifier of jouissance, the phallus. The imaginary, the body, penis, and the symbolic, the signifier, phallus, are supposed to overlap without any remainder. For now, let us leave aside the problematic status of this biological reduction, the identification of the phallus with the penis, which is already a fetishist lapsist. What matters is the insight that the subject's belief in a female penis functions as a screen for another belief that concerns the subject's own relation to castration. Freud discovers that fetishism involves a belief in the non-universality of castration. Through the hypothesis of the non-castrated other, the phallic woman, the fetishist postulates his own non-castration and avoids the link between truth and negativity. By making of the woman a non-castrated exception, he simultaneously exempts himself from castration. We can notice in passing that Lacan formalizes this fetishist belief in his masculine formulas of sexuation, in which the universality of the phallic function is supported by the phallic exception, some sort of metaphallus impossible to castrate. So this is page 311, um, and there is a graph with a lot of symbols, so I can't really describe it, but it's the formulas of sexuation. So if you want to have a look, it's on page 311. The masculine formulas contain Freud's myth of the primordial father, the uncastrated bearer of castration, who can be castrated only by being murdered. The point of this translation is that, beyond biology and the amateur ethnology of Freud's reconstructions of cultural prehistory, it uncovers the structure of the fetishist disavowal, where the subject is split between the verification of castration, the encounter with sexual difference, 
which takes the form of misunderstanding that the woman is lacking the organ of jouissance and the falsification of castration, since the fetish substitutes the supposedly missing organ. If we move to the lower level of Lacan's formulas, which concern the relation of the subject to the object of jouissance, we find the fetishist relation symbolized by the vector that goes from the barred subject to the object A on the feminine side. The fetish completes the feminine subject and in the end reduces the woman to an object. The subject cannot enjoy in the body of the other. He can only play with the organ of jouissance embodied by the fetish. Still, for Freud, the function of the fetish is more ambiguous. It is true that on the one hand it is declared to substitute the penis, which seems to be in accordance with the phallocentric reading in the vulgar anatomical sense. On the other hand, the phallus is also, and above all, a hieroglyph of castration, and in this respect it signifies the radical absence of the organ of jouissance. The phallus is a dethroning of the penis as the privileged organ of jouissance showing that the metanymization of jouissance cannot be avoided and that the penis is merely one organ among others. But differently, the penis already is a prosthetic phallus. Freud's discussion of the fetishist case concludes with this radical ambiguity of the fetish. The observation of a woman's body in the same move verifies and falsifies, preserves and abolishes the hypothesis of the feminine phallus. It is not true that, after the child has made his observation of the woman, he has preserved unaltered his belief that women have a phallus. He has retained that belief, but he has also given it up. Yes, in his mind the woman has got a penis in spite of everything, but this penis is no longer the same as it was before. Something else has taken its place, has been appointed its substitute, as it were, and now inherits the interest which was formerly directed to its predecessor. But this interest suffers an extraordinary increase as well, because the horror of castration has set up a memorial to itself in the creation of this substitute. The hypothesis in fact emerges together with the child's first confrontation with sexual difference. In this observation, the subject obtains the insight that he is always already castrated, i.e. that his being depends and emerges from difference that defines the signifier. The observation is surely empirical, but it is also inscribed into structure, just as commodity fetishism is not merely a way to experience the objects of value, but inevitably follows from the double character of the commodity. Being a memorial of castration, the fetish designates the opposite of the organ of jouissance, the materialization of a radical absence, which consequently implies that the perverse subject is anything but uncastrated. Castration is neither neutralized nor overcome. On the contrary, the fetish is its negative, a negation of negativity. Castration may be abolished in the empirical object, which is turned into a prosthetic organ, but it is sustained in the signifier. The ambiguity of Freud's biological signification goes even further. What is the feminine phallus? It is not an actual but a hypothetical organ, which differs from the male penis, and which never existed. The, feti the fetish masks a negativity that reaches beyond the anatomical and biological context, not the inexistence of something that could potentially exist, but something whose existence is strictly speaking impossible, an organ of jouissance that would abolish the negativity in the field of sexuality and establish a sexual relation. There is no organ of jouissance, but there is a signifier of jouissance, and this signifier covers the interdependency between jouissance and castration. The difference between the masculine and the feminine penis should therefore obtain its full symbolic weight. If the fetish is given as a substitute, a placeholder of something else, it is not a substitute of something that is, but of something that is not. Again, not of something that does not exist only on the feminine body, but of something that does not exist on the speaking body as such. What the subject deals with is jouissance without the organ, jouissance caused by the signifier. The fetish merely appears to substitute something that could potentially or actually exist. Its main function is to reject castration from the symbolic, but this move always backfires and the fetish turns from a prosthetic organ into a monument of castration 
thereby enunciating something essential about the subject of the signifier. Freud translated this lesson in the universality of castration. There is no uncastrated subject, and perversion is, in this respect, no metaposition either. Unlike Deleuze, who saw in masochism a subversive, subjective position, psychoanalysis detects the true subversive potential in neurosis, where jouissance is directly exposed as impossible to sustain. Freud thus spoke of neurosis as the negative of perversion, and Lacan as a failed perversion. The neurotic might appear a loser in the eyes of the, per of the pervert, but his position in fact reveals the limit of fetishism. The neurotic repression contains an assumption of castration and reveals in neurosis a particular prote uh, protest against the structurally imposed perversion. Recall that for Freud, the neurotics are the embodiments of cultural discontent, unbehagen in der Kultur, cultural products which are not unrelated to the various traumatic effects of capitalism. In the fetishist masquerade, the subject encounters his own castration in the feminine other in the form of absence of the organ of jouissance. The observation of the woman's body dupes the child with the appearance that there is something missing. Freud, too, might have been duped by the same appearance, but the reduction of the biological signification to logical mechanisms in the background reveals that his brief text contains a more general truth, a truth that explains what psychoanalysis understands by castration, not the absence of some potential presence, but the impossibility to establish a relation between the surplus and the lack, the production of jouissance, and the production of subjectivity, the impossibility to enjoy to enjoy sans entrave, without negativity and alienation. If Freud needs to be corrected, then it is in the following way. Anatomy is fantasy, and not destiny. Once the confusion between the phallus and the penis is abolished, the conclusion is at hand that there is a multiplicity of prosthetic organs, but there is one signifier of jouissance, the phallus, albeit with no adequate organic reference. And there is one jouissance, the one caused by the signifier in the speaking body. The whole problem, therefore, comes down to the fact that the signifier of jouissance has no corresponding organ on the living body. It can designate several bodily regions or pieces of flesh as the privileged support of jouissance. This multiplicity merely reveals that there cannot be any adequatio? Ad between the anatomical body and the libidinal body, or differently put, an adequate relation can be forced only under the condition that one fetishizes the penis as the organ. That all fetish objects are merely prosthetic substitutes of the penis is a wrong conclusion, since the penis is no less a prosthetic organ. Hence, Lacan will correct Freud. The phallus is neither an organ nor an object, but the signifier which designates the capacity of the signifier, the autonomy of the system of differences, to cause jouissance and to bring a split subject into being. As a signifier, the phallus signifies both jouissance and its lack. At this point, it becomes clearer in what respect Marx's homonym anticipates psychoanalysis. The best lesson for understanding the ambiguous status of the phallus between the biological and the linguistic can be found in the first edition of Capital, where the discussion of the general equivalent contains an excellent point that Marx unfortunately omitted from the second edition. It is as if alongside and external to lions, tigers, rabbits, and all other actual animals, which form when grouped together the various kinds, species, subspecies, families, etc. of the animal kingdom, there existed in addition the animal, the individual incarnation of the entire animal kingdom, such a particular which contains within itself all really present species of the same entity is a universal, like animal, god, etc. In order to exemplify the structure of the commodity universe, Marx's comparison outlines two situations, one in which we have the abstract set animal comprising all particular animals, and another in which this set contains itself as a particular embodiment. Unlike the animal kingdom, the commodity world is indeed structured like Russell's paradox of a set containing itself as an element. The animal is first presented as an abstract universality contained in every animal, and then as a concrete abstract universality 
sensual, supersensual thing, an element of the animal kingdom and its limit. Because the universality of the commodity world can be held in hands, money is the privileged object of fetishism. The space of values is curved, and this internal torsion supports the apparition of generality in the form of particularity. Fetishization of the general equivalent becomes a particular case of fetishism and a universal model. The general equivalent actually abolishes the classical understanding of the relation between the universal and the particular, being both a concrete universality and an abstract particularity. The couple formed by desire and drive perfectly responds to this double sub or double aspect. As an abstract particularity, the general equivalent endows commodities with the power to cause desire, making them more than objects that satisfy human needs in an unproblematic way. As a concrete universality, it becomes the object of the drive because it embodies the value of jouissance. As abstract particularity, money embodies the autonomy of the chain of commodities and of the metonomic movement that directs desire from one particular object to another making it chase its object of satisfaction that appears to be lacking. The failure of desire consists in the impossibility of its passing from abstract particularity to concrete universality, which would solely provide its, its satisfaction, and thereby its abolition. For on the side of concrete universality, we encounter the drive, which addresses the object immediately, that is, through the mediation of money, while in desire, the mediation is doubled because it remains stuck on the relation between commodities and commodity. The general equivalent raises the same logical and topological problem as the phallus in the universe of signifiers. The phallus is the animal, the general equivalent of jouissance. Even if Freud believed he had found in the unconscious hypothesis of the feminine phallus a justification for its biological signification, the phallus brings the causality of the signifier to the point. Pursuing its biological signification, psychoanalysts might insist that the feminine phallus is equivalent to the body as such, and not to the masculine penis. <clears throat> Due to this differentiation, they introduce the distinction between having and being a phallus, which supposedly, which supposedly translates sexual difference. Lacan's claim that the phallus stands for the entirety of the signifying effects, as always, complicated the matter. Freud's mistake was that his later work sought to rationalize his earlier insight, which placed the cause of jouissance entirely on the side of the signifier. The primacy of the signifier clarifies the three essays on the theory of sexuality, which turn around the fact that there is no such thing as normative sexuality and that every, bo every body region can become an organ of jouissance. The part played by the erotogenic zones is immediately obvious in the case of those perversions which assign a sexual significance to the oral and anal orifices. These behave in every respect like a portion of the sexual apparatus. In hysteria, these parts of the body in the neighboring tracts of mucous membrane become the seat of new sensations and of changes in innervation, indeed of processes that can be compared to erection in just the same way as do the actual genitalia under the excitations of the normal sexual processes. In, scopophil in scopophilia and ex exhibitionism, the eye corresponds to an erotogenic zone, while in the case of those components of the sexual instinct, which involve pain and cruelty, the same role is assumed by the skin. The skin, which in particular parts of the body has become differentiated into sense organs or modified into mucous membrane, and is thus the erotogenic zone par excellence. Freud describes here precisely the attribution of the value of jouissance or sexual significance to a body part, which integrates it in the libidinal economy, transforming anatomy into a component of the sexual apparatus. As soon as the signifier is envisaged as an apparatus of jouissance, Biology and anatomy become problematic, just as use value became problematic and colonized with abstraction in Marx's account of the commodity form. What matters again is that every er erogenous zone can behave as an organ of jouissance under the condition that an intervention of the signifier has occurred. In the last instance, the bodily surface is the site of the causality of the signifier, which separates the body from itself. 
the skin being the border, where the anatomical and the libidinal body become equivocal. Let us at this point return to Lacan's formulas of sexuation. In relation to the feminine position, Lacan raises the question of the other jouissance, a jouissance that would be beyond the fetishism of the object, but this other jouissance remains without a signifier. Rather than abolishing fetishism, the feminine position contains a displacement from the small other to the big other, from the fetishism of the object to the fetishism of the signifier. This move enables us to expose the truth of fetishism, castration the split that constitutes the subject. The controversial in existence of the woman that Lacan professes alongside the elaboration of the formulas of sexuation addresses this problem. The woman does not exist means first and foremost that the subject does not exist, that the subject designates an empty place of radical split which can be assumed by multiple figures. In Freud, this position is assumed by the hysteric and in Marx by the proletarian. The unveiling of castration splits the phallic function, whose universality is affirmed without exception. <coughs> the negation of the metaphallic exception. The immediate consequence of the abolition of exception is that the phallic function no longer totalizes the field of jouissance. For this reason, Lacan's second formula of feminine sexuation states that not all subject falls under the phallic function. Does this mean that the feminine position abolishes the general equivalent? No, since it already affirmed its universality by undermining the exception, which supported the masculine fetishism. The lower feminine formula of sexuation simply states that the, that the point where the universality of the general equivalent breaks is the subject itself. The feminine position thereby unveils in the, in the apparently closed and homogeneous commodity universe, unexchangeable negativity and points towards the logical and the actual opposition of the fetish, the symptom. It is not unusual that the function of the symptom, the rejection of universal fetishization, and the emphasis on the unexchangeable are most evident in hysteria, which played such an important role in the invention of psychoanalysis. But here too, Marx's critique contains anticipation.